My name is Rachel Ellsbury. I live in Austin, Texas, and I am a participant in Moderna's vaccine trial for COVID-19. done several vaccine studies with benchmark research in the past and when this study became available here in Austin for Moderna they called me and asked me if I wanted to participate and I of course said yes please sign me up I've done this will be I think the third study I've done with them what I did know about the study is that it was from Moderna and that the study was using mRNA instead of live virus or dead virus. I knew that I wasn't going to be getting virus injected into my body. It was using existing science and existing technology surrounding mRNA. Since it was my third vaccine trial, I was not concerned. I kind of, you know, it wasn't my first rodeo. I, I knew how these things went. Um, mm -hmm. It's a lot of blood draws, uh, a lot of waiting. Uh, typically when they give you a vaccine, they have to wait and observe you for an hour afterward to make sure that there are no side effects. Because if you're going to have side effects from a vaccine, it's usually within that first hour. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to get weighed, lots of blood work. Um, I would see a physician every time I went in. I knew all of those things because I'd done several studies before. So I didn't really expect it to be too much different, to be honest. So I didn't have any concerns from the actual protocol of the study and in terms of how it be, would be facilitated and executed. Um, and I also am very much a believer in science. I know that by the time that they're injecting something into someone's arms from the perspective of a vaccine trial, that things are pretty far along and that they feel relatively good about it being safe. So I've never ever had that kind of vaccine hesitancy. Obviously I've signed up for three vaccine trials. So um, no, I didn't really expect it to be, I didn't really expect anything bad to happen. I've, I've always been a big proponent of vaccines. I mean, I'm the girl who's getting a flu shot every year mm -hmm. as soon as they're available. I'm the one encouraging my friends to get a a, a flu shot every year. Um, I just turned 50 years old. So the next thing for me within the next month is to get a shingles or Shingrex is what it's called. It's a vaccine for shingles. I always tell people who are in their mid sixties that they need to be getting that extra super duper flu shot. They need to be getting that pneumonia shot so that you can be protected. I'm someone who likes to eliminate all the variables in terms of my health. So if I can do small things like get vaccines, uh, eat right, exercise, uh, that's kind of eliminating some of the things that, that I can to make sure that I'm keeping myself healthy. So I've always looked at vaccines as being a, a miracle of our time, to be honest. You know, we, we're very lucky to live in the age and era that we do because these are diseases in the past that did kill people. Things like the flu, well, the flu still kills tens of thousands of people every year, but smallpox, measles, all of these things that have basically been eradicated over the years because of vaccines and science. And so I believe in science. I believe sci believe in scientists. And um, so no, I've, I've never been someone who's vaccine hesitant by any means. I'm also the daughter of a nurse. As the, the daughter of a nurse, you know, you're not really going to get around uh, vaccines when you're the daughter of a nurse. You're going to you're going to you're going to roll up your sleeve and stick your arm out and let them stick it with a needle. <laughs> That's just the way it goes. I was in phase two of the Moderna trial and in phase two, they were trying to see whether or not the 50 milligram or the 100 milligram uh, was more effective than the other, if there was any difference between the two. So I was either gonna get a placebo, the 50 milligram or the 100 milligram. So I had a, you know, one in three chance of getting, you know, any of those three things. Um, so what they, in phase two, they needed especially healthy people, whereas in phase three, which is what they're in now, they were looking for a more broad 
picture of the population. So they were looking for people who had some pre-existing conditions and things like that for phase three. But for phase two, you had to meet some pretty you know, stringent criteria from BMI to couldn't be diabetic or have high blood pressure or a history of cancer or in anything like that. So I was first screened for those things. Second thing we did was a blood draw. And from that blood draw, they tested various things. They are making sure that I did not have COVID antibodies because you don't want to test a vaccine that you're trying to hope, trying to get someone to develop antibodies. If they already have them, you're, you're not going to get the result you want in a, in a trial like that. So they tested for that. They also did COVID testing. So I have been COVID tested probably more than most people because that's pretty frequent in, in the process. So they did that. I made it through that first, you know, screen those first two screenings and I was in the trials. The first thing that happens is you get the shot. They observe you for an hour after you get the shot. So that first visit is about a four hour visit because of all of the things that they need to do that day. And then 28 days later, I got the second shot, uh, which is what people who actually do get the Moderna vaccine or the Pfizer vaccine, it's uh, 21 days later. But so it's a two part vaccine for both Pfizer and Moderna. And since then, I've been back a couple of times. Um, I, blood draws every time they're testing to see if I have antibodies. And then my next visit is December 30th. I'll do a blood draw then. I've kept a diary for them, an electronic diary throughout the process. They call me once a month to ask me a series of questions. Typically the questions are, have you been exposed to anyone that you knew had COVID? Have you gotten, do you think you have COVID? Things like that. And then I'll go back again this summer, June or July for another blood, blood draw. And that will be the end of the study for me. People at Benchmark Research are people who cross every T and dot every I. You know, they really, um, they really are good about that. So, having done other studies with them before, I knew they would be in this circumstance. You know, I didn't know in terms of what the side effects would be because that's part of what they were testing for. Um, but I, I kind of had an idea. I mean, yeah, what we were thinking would probably make us feel a little flu-like, and it did for. So the first, uh, the first shot, all I had in terms of side effects or symptoms was a really sore arm, really sore, like beyond any other soreness I'd have ever felt from a shot before. From what people have described to me about the Shingrex vaccine for shingles, it sounds like it feels the same way as that vaccine. Your arm just is really sore and kind of hard and firm around the injection site for several days. And then after the second vaccine, because I've done so many vaccine trials and I've had so many different shots over the years, I had kind of forgotten that I had it until the next day, about 24 hours later, I felt a little flu-like, just kind of how you feel when you have that first onset of the flu, achy, a little tired, just kind of not right. And I thought, oh, that's what this is. I had a mild fever. I took a Tylenol and took a nap and that was it. That was really the only symptoms or side effects I had um, other than the sore arm. Pretty normal in terms of protocol for a clinical trial or a vaccine study. Since I've been in several others, it was very similar. Um, I am surprised that it is as effective as it is. I mean, that is incredibly exciting. 94, 95% effective is, is huge. I think that they originally were hoping for 50%. So the fact that it's as effective as they say it is, 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 is huge. I mean, that means really big things for us. It means that we, you know, if we do have people out there who are vaccine hesitant and don't get the vaccine, we may not need as many people to get vaccinated as we originally would have if the vaccine were only 50% effective. That doesn't mean that I think that people shouldn't get vaccinated, but you know, the reality is the reality. There are people who are just not gonna do this. And so this does help in terms of countering the, the bat. Um, 
it's just really exciting. It's pretty remarkable, actually, that that this uh, is that effective. And here we are in December, and people are getting vaccinated. It's 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 wonderful. to me the whole idea of rushing a vaccine and this idea that vaccines should take a long time. We don't have a long time. We're losing 3,000 people a day right now to this virus. So we don't have a long time. But on the other side of this, this technology and this science already existed. They had been working on the mRNA science for a long time and they tried it out with COVID and it works. So really this has been years in the making. It's just taking existing science and applying it to this virus. So for people who are vaccine hesitant because it seems rushed or it happened quickly, it really didn't. There, have, there are scientists who have, have spent a lot of their lives working on this science and this technology. And what's wonderful about this is that this mRNA technology could be used for other things. This isn't the only disease that's ever going to come along and have the potential to be a pandemic. So mRNA, mRNA science and mRNA technology gives us great hope for not just COVID and overcoming this pandemic, but for overcoming the next one and possibly various cancers. I've heard that it may have uh, uses for sickle cell. So all of these things are, um, it's really remarkable. It's quite exciting. It's, we're on the precipice of something quite remarkable in terms of science. Where, where masking and social distancing have not worked as well as we would like because people haven't been great about doing both of those things, which is why we are where we are right now in America, the vaccine comes along and gives us hope. I call it hope in a syringe, and it really is that. I think that, you know, right now we're looking at not being able to spend Christmas with our families. Some of us didn't get to spend Thanksgiving with our families. Halloween wasn't what it typically is for the kids out there who want to go trick or treating. But I think by next year, we're going to be looking at getting to do Halloween again. We're going to be looking at getting to do Thanksgiving again and Christmas. And that's something to look forward to and feel really good about. I want people to maybe spend a little less time in Facebook groups that are spreading fear and anti-vax sentiment. That would be a first bit of advice I would say to people. There's a lot of great research and information out there, though, about this, and I would ex I would ask people to take a deep dive into the science. Uh, the, there is information about the science. There's information about mRNA technology and how it got us to where we are and why it allowed us to bring this vaccine to the marketplace so quickly. So um, I, I would say that um, also, this is remarkable in that people came together on the science side, on the medical side. Um, there's that piece. Then there's tens of thousands of Americans from all over this country who stepped up. They rolled up their sleeve. They stuck their arm out and they stepped into the unknown so that we could be here today. And then there are people on, on the other side who are UPS drivers. They're the pilot for FedEx who will be delivering these vaccines across the world. So across the world and across America. So it this is an effort that took so many people to do their part and do their role and step up. And I think we should be celebrating this vaccine, not doubting it is we've fretted so much throughout this pandemic about the effects of what this, you know, kids having to do distance learning uh, has done done to in terms of their ability to learn and what their future will look like. And it, and it cracks me up that people are so worried about whether or not kids will learn because we're going to raise them up to be scientists and then not listen to them. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't get that. So, you know, I, I, we, we need to listen to people who have gone to school to do this, who have studied to do this, because most of the scientists who do this kind of thing, 
they are hardcore into this. This is what they do. This is their life's work. And um, thank God for those people. Thank God they exist. I mean, it's a, we, we're, we are blessed because of them. So I did get the phone call to join the study. Um, but one of the other reasons for me that I joined the study is um, in mid-March, my cousin's father came down with COVID. He's an EMT in the Detroit metro area. And by the by Easter weekend, he had passed away. He was 51 years old. He should not, you know, he's not someone who had a pre-existing condition. He was a healthy man. He was on the job, you know, taking care of people when he contracted COVID. So I think that when this touches you or touches your family, you take a look at COVID differently. If it hasn't touched you and it hasn't touched your family, you're very lucky because I do believe before this is all said and done that we will all know someone who has passed away from COVID-19. And um, you do look at this differently. You do um, understand your own mortality differently. And um, yeah, I think you overall just see this uh, as something very real. The people who are out there saying it's not real and it's a hoax, when it touches your family, it's not a hoax.